back to Bike Channel episode three. We've got to start this week's show, obviously, with the sad and tragic news of the death and passing of Marco Simoncelli at the weekend at the Malaysian Grand Prix. Now, while it's always a shock when anyone dies in the world of motorsport, I think everyone will agree with me and say it's even more tragic when it's someone who is so talented and so popular and just so honest and forthright as Marco. I mean, former 250cc world champion, he had an incredible year in MotoGP this year and having signed for the factory Honda team next year, I think everyone pretty much acknowledges he would have been in for a shot at the title. Yeah, obviously our thoughts are with his friends and family. You can read some really lovely tributes to Marco at MotoGP.com and you can also leave your own tribute as well if you wish. So, coming up on this week's show... I get to grips with the Harley Fat Boys special. I go to Silverstone for Ducati HQ's launch party. And we welcome international superstar DJ and all-round nice guy and biking nut Carl Cox into the studio. But first up, Luke, you headed to the seaside, didn't you, with your little bucket and spade and speedos? Well, not, not so much the speedos, it's a mental image no one needs. Board shorts, obviously, a little knotted, knotted handkerchief and a Factor 50 sun cream, yeah. I headed down to Brighton for one of the biggest biking events in the UK calendar year. It's called the Brighton Burn-Up. And uh, over 100,000 people head to the seaside to muck about on bikes, check out some cool displays, have a dance, and well, just generally hang out with their biking fraternity. So I thought I'd go down and see what the fuss was about. Winter is fast approaching, but you know what? The sun is in the sky and uh, tens of thousands of bikers have headed down to the seafront here in Brighton for the Brighton Burnout. Check it out! Right then, well, uh, I thought it'd be apt to talk to the man who's really responsible for pretty much all of this, Mark Wilsmore, owner of the Ace Cafe. Uh, my friend, hello. Yeah, good to meet you, Luke. Good to meet. Thank you for having us down. My first time down here at the Brighton Burnout. Uh, what a blooming spectacular event. Yeah, it's our 18th annual reunion this year. The first, back in 94, was actually at the cafe. Okay. But now I think of it, the second one, we did a ride from the cafe in 95. We hadn't quite sorted things at Brighton, and we went off to another calf up in the Midlands at Jack's Hill. But in, I think it was 96, yeah, I'm sure it was 96, the first year we got it organised down here and reunions been here since 96. But it's also the 10th anniversary of the calf having reopened this year. Of course, yeah. And, and, and so far, it's been a bit of a shower, but so far we seem to have got away with the weather again. It's lovely to see that there's so many different types of bikers here, you know, we were talking about this earlier, they're guys who, you know, come to Brighton for the day on the bikes, yeah. you know, like legendary guys like yourself, people who've come down on their sports bikes, people who come down on custom, so many different types of bikers. Yeah, it's it's uh, proper all sorts, yeah. as, as you're saying, and, and that I think is part of the appeal, the seaside, nice sunny day, one overall shared interest, yeah, different nuances of, of the types of bikes, but it's that one common interest that whole holds together. And of course, the seafront here ha has a history going back to 64, yeah. the famous clashes, the mods and the rockers. So there's a sea of scooters and the mods and all sharply dressed and that, still carrying it off really pucker. Yeah. And as you come along from the pier he he heading east, you've got gold stars and that. And then it all evolves into street fighters and at the furthest end from the pier on this seafront we've got a um, stunt show going yeah. on with some real top boys there and this is really gets really embarrassing because I'm getting old and I can't remember the names. There's three shows down there and if I'm not mistaken there's the wall of death that so it's, it's everything in two wheels. Well listen it's just so a pleasure to be here today I mean it's, it's blown me away the amount of people here and everything else that's going on I suppose we should probably go and check out the rest of it really shouldn't we? And hopefully see you at the ace. So, for some unknown reason, I've been attracted here to the Bennett stand. It might be to do with the ladies in the lycra behind there, but obviously not. I'm not that shallow. Um, but I did bump into Michael, the communication manager for Bennett. How are you, mate? You right? Yeah, nice to meet you. Yeah, not dressed in lycra. Not today. No, well, it's probably a good thing that me and you aren't, to be fair. <laughs> I don't think we quite have the figures as the girls. But um, what, what are you doing here at this event? The Brighton Burn Up is a fabulous event. I think it's 18 years strong now. and. Uh, we're developing a relationship with it to um, to really try and try and get 
into the minds of the bikers. It provides us the ideal opportunity to come and talk to uh, our target audience. 100,000 people here expected today and it uh, gives us a great chance to, um, to talk to them uh -huh. about not only insurance but about all the other great things that Bennett's does. Yeah, I mean, I noticed actually on the stand you have got guys just constantly coming up to you, asking you questions, you're interacting with them, giving away goodies. You've got a competition on as well at the moment. Yes, yeah, several competitions actually. We've got the Bennett's Biker Dreams competition. We've also got three fabulous looking bikes right behind us. The, uh, the scooter, the Piaggio scooter, the XJ6 Yamaha and the S1000 BMW yeah. that we're giving away. Um, again, promoting our, our Facebook uh, page too. Which, give it a plug, is? <laughs> Facebook.com slash Bennett's Bike. You've also got the Bennett's Bike over there, the kind of bucking Bronco bike type thing. Um, I unfortunately have hurt my neck recently uh, and, and damaged the nail earlier, so I won't be able to go on it, but <laughs> I understand we might be able to get some girls on that later. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this is part of our setup that we take uh, to the um, all of the Bennett's live events that we call it. It's a campaign that we run. We go to a lot of different biking events for all, all different shapes and sizes throughout the year and all, all around the country. But the bucking bike is one of the most popular uh, parts of it. Uh, Michael, brilliant chatting to you. Have a brilliant rest of the day as well, and uh, thanks a lot for taking the time. Yeah, thank you. Have a good day too. So I've managed to find this man here, Richard, who is emceeing the stunt show today. Buddy, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. How are you doing? Very, very well, mate. Really enjoying the Brighton burnout, but looking forward to seeing uh, three guys it is going to be going head to head. Tell us a little bit more about who they are and why they're competing today. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, basically what we've got is we've got a, um, a large freestyle competition that we run sort of annually with the Ace Cafe in London. Um, so this is a little bit of a demo here today, just with four riders, just to show us what's going on, what happens when we do one of the major competitions, because we get like 30, 40 riders from all around the world coming across to compete with that, and there's big prize money and stuff. So it's just a little bit of a demo today. We do a little bit of an individual freestyle, where the guys get three minutes to go out and do a load of tricks, impress the crowd. We get the crowd to kind of vote it, no prizes, nothing like that. <laughs> So all in all, pretty much the perfect day. We've had the sun, the sea, and a shed load of motorbikes. Met some amazing people, had a lot of fun, and we've got to see four girls in Lycra on a bucking bronco. What more could you possibly want? Brighton Burnout, thank you. Oh, the summer seems like a distant memory. But Luke, just uh, remind us, what was it called again? Yeah, that's really bad, novice, rubbishy type presenting style thing. It's called the Brighton Burn Up. Uh, oh. It was my first time there and I was so excited with the sun out and all those bikes. There were just thousands and thousands of bikes that I kept calling the Brighton Burn Out. So apologies. And thanks to everyone that uh, made the day really, really special. It was a wicked time and I was pretty much in heaven down there. Yeah, it looked fantastic. Right then, I've been riding a bike. You know me, I don't like to show off when it comes to motorbikes, so no. I thought I'd do something small, cheap, affordable, practical. Well, maybe not. £16,000? If you've got it spare, you might want to buy one of these. Welcome to Harley Davidson Guildford, where we've been out and about on this, the Fat Boy Special, and we thought we'd stop off here as a very apt place to tell you what we think of this rather sexy and amazing looking machine. Okay, so first up, what's a Fat Boy special? Well, it's pretty much a standard Harley Davidson at Fat Boy, but with a few cosmetic changes. Like you can see, the solid black front wheel, you've got engine casings coated in matte black paint, also the exhaust, and generally it just looks a little bit meaner and a little bit cooler, if you ask me. Price-wise, it comes in at £15,865, just under 16 grand for this beast, which isn't that much more than the normal Fat Boy. In fact, I think it's only a couple of hundred extra quid more. 
And uh, for that, well, you're getting a hell of a piece of equipment. It does seem a huge amount of money, though, when you compare it to modern-day rivals like the Victory Hammer S, which is 14 and a half grand, and the Triumph Thunderbird Storm, which comes in, what, just under £13,000. But, of course, one of the reasons you're paying that much more is it has got that on the tank. And I can tell you all the little cosmetic things about this bike do add up. If you look at the engine casing, you can see the silver and chrome effects on so many of the little parts, and it just looks spectacular. And do you know what? I ride probably some of the most exotic bikes in the world, but nothing ever garners the same attention as a Harley Davidson. I went to a pub the other day, literally went inside for five minutes for a coffee, I'd like to add, and when I came out, there were eight guys standing around having a cigarette, all looking at the bike, all wanting to know all about it. None of them bikers, but everyone knowing that badge on the tank and everyone wanting to get a piece of it if they can. The bike itself, or well, the engine is a 1584 uh, V-Twin, which hasn't really changed much in about, about 60, 70 years. They've been making additions to it uh, every now and again. It produces 65 brake horsepower. But it's not really about top-end power in a Harley, it's more about the torque. This has got 89 pounds per foot of torque, which isn't exactly going to rip your head off, like something like the Victory Hammer or maybe the Triumph Thunderbird or the Thunderbird Storm, but delivers a real solid performance, shall we say, that, you know, we'll keep you chugging along at 50 miles an hour, get you up to kind of 90 to 100 if you really want to, but without any fairings on, without a screen on, you don't want to go much faster than that. And hey, it's a Harley. It was designed to be ridden at 30 to 50 miles an hour, with you having some tassels coming off the back and enjoying the view and the scenery. Brakes are better, better than most Harleys. Still, I'm not, you know, not that convinced. I think that they could upgrade them. And uh, personally, I think it's something when you're riding a 313 kilogram bike, you want a bit more confidence in. But as an actual kind of ride experience, it's pretty spectacular. It's so comfortable. It's like riding an armchair. It absorbs all the speed bumps, the potholes, and we've had so many of those since it snowed over the winter. And it does make you feel really, really special. So overall, this is definitely one of my favourite Harley Davidsons. I'm a big fan of the Fat Bob, I'm a big fan of the Fat Boys, and I think this one looks a little bit nicer than the standard Fat Boy. Depends which one you want to go for, the chrome or the matte black finish. I'm a rocker and a metaler, so the matte black to me always comes out on top. My thing is this, look, it's £16,000 roughly. After that, you're going to want to spend at least a grand on a good set of exhaust on it. So you're looking at about seventeen grand for a bike that, while spectacular looking and really nice to ride, is actually technologically and I suppose in the day, modern day terms of bikes behind a lot of its competitors. People don't care about that. Buying a Harley is a lifestyle choice. It's not something you go and do with a rational brain on because spending 16, 17 grand on a bike that, let's be honest, can be outperformed and has, doesn't have as probably good and as modern components as a bike that will cost you 12 and a half, 13 grand isn't common sense, but these bikes are all about passion. If you've ever wanted to ride a motorbike, most people start off thinking, seeing Holly Davidson's very kid and seeing that's what they want to do. So many people I know buy Hollies have never ridden anything else because they're not interested in it. And you know, with the accessories and the customizations you can get with it, with the clubs that everyone joins when you ride Holly Davidson's and going to bike meets and stuff, there is nothing like them. So in other words, thebikechannel.com, I'm giving the Fat Boy Special a bit of a thumbs up. Still think it's a bit too expensive, but if you've got the money, money no object to you, and you don't have to worry about common sense and practicality, then my goodness, go get yourself one of these, and uh, I think you're going to fall in love with it. Special definitely has street presence, and this is proven on Towie. T what? <laughs> the only way is Essex. Oh, come on, you oh, must have seen it. You mean my favourite TV show that I watch every week? Well, Kurt on Towie, yeah. his dad Mick, who's probably mm. about 50, he owns the Fat Boy Special and he pulls girls half his age. Well, there you go, man. If you've got £16,000 in your bank account and you fancy pulling girls half your age, go get yourself a Harley Fat Boy Special right now. It works. Right, then, we've got to take a break now. Coming up after the break, we will be chatting to international superstar DJ, all-round nice guy and incredibly passionate biker nut, Carl Cox. Yep, and I head to Silverstone to party. <laughs>
created 2,200 tonnes of dirt brought in to create an indoor off-road zone and over a thousand people, both adults and children, will get their first opportunity to have an off-road experience. It's an exciting, exciting sport and people love the thrill and they love adrenaline and uh, that's why you get people coming to the show looking at a bike. So we come every year. Yeah, don't be shy, it's alright. If you're anticipating on getting onto a bike, it's well worth a trip. Dip your toe in the water and see what it feels like. Welcome back to the Bike Channel Show Part 2. Now, Susie, I've got a slight bone to pick with you, I'm not going to lie. Um, you know I like going to a party. I don't get out much as it is, and, and I like to put my dancing shoes and my posh frock and my head off and, you know, trip the light fandango. But you went to a massive party and you didn't invite me. I know. Well, there was a free bar and there's a safety precaution. We couldn't invite you. What, what, what do you mean? You know what happened last time. Oh, yeah. Well, tonight I'm here at Ducati UK's headquarters building launch at Silverstone. Today we've seen lots of track action, Ducati have invited the media and of course lots of sporting personalities such as Michael Rutter, James Hayden, Chris Walker, we've even seen Neil Hodgson here and they can take out any bike, any Ducati bike that they want onto the track. We've even got the CEO, the big boss man, Gabriel Del Corquillo, who's just over my shoulder there. He's here as well. But now it's time to throw some shapes on the dance floor. One of the things about Ducati as a brand is it has soul. Ducati is premium, Ducati is innovation, Ducati is racing. I see Ducati as a family and, and we see that we see Ducati as very much a premium brand that helps to give us the credibility um, to sell other areas. I was really interested to see the new facility because um, you know I just think it's fantastic for the industry as a whole and uh, and for Silverstone to see it part of a, a growing project down here which I think is just great for British motorsport. Definitely it's the ideal place for us to be. Um, we come into work now in the mornings we hear the bikes we hear cars it is just fabulous. venue, great premises and um, you know you get a real buzz every time you come into work every day. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a great place to be. It's state of the art, it's everything, it's stylish, it's typical Ducati really. Central, you got the M1, you got the M40, you're in this Silicon Valley of motorsports. The whole technology park concept alongside is fantastic. And to have the track next door, I mean, you're going to get the right sort of businesses all together. It's great. It just does feel like we've come home and we all work together as one team. It's excellent. Being by the racetrack, it is like coming home. So it just has a fantastic vibe about it. I'm not going to lie, Susie, that looked like a wicked party. Oh, you look spectacular. I mean, oh, you know what thanks. I mean? I'm... Did you like the old um, bun on the head? It was very, very nice. And you know I'm well up with ladies' hair fashion. Um, but yeah, it looked amazing. Now, um, I can get over the fact that I wasn't invited in time. It will take time. But um, did you actually get on the dance floor and pull some shapes? No, do you know what? I didn't because A, I dance like my dad. <laughs> A lot of arm action. It's a good dance. And B, it wasn't really my kind of music. What kind of stuff are you into then? Well, a bit of techno, a bit of hard house. Ah, uh, you see, now what you should have done is taken our guest this week along with you because he knows a thing or two about techno and hard house. Right 
then, as you know here at Bike Channel, we are always pestered by celebrity guests, just turning up on the doorstep, wanting to get on air. And you know what, we've got some small time DJ, probably haven't heard of him. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, international superstar, Mr. <laughs> Carl Cox. It is a real pleasure to have you on the show, sir. Thank you, thank you. Been a massive fan of, I mean, you're such a pioneer in the world of DJing, and, and, and it seems almost strange to get you on here. <laughs> oh, no. And not talk about that massively, but um, you're a big bike fan, aren't you? Yeah, I've been really into bikes since I was like 13, 14 years old, and uh, I was always on dirt bikes and doing jumps and, and crazy stuff with the, with the dirt bikes many years ago. Um, but then I found myself, uh, soon as, soon as I got a 50cc engine on, a, on a, any motorbike, it was the Yamaha FS1E, yeah. uh, <clears throat> now known as uh, obviously the Fizzy, yeah, uh, yeah. And, and also nowadays these bikes are actually worth quite a bit of money. Fizzies are worth loads because they're like proper collector's items. The proper collector's item. I wish I knew that when I crashed about four of them in the <laughs> early days. <laughs> I would have had them now as collectors. But then uh, all the way through that I, I ended up with a DT175 Yamaha uh, which was for me it was just like Duh, when I saw the brochure and everything it was one of those must bikes, bike. have to, 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 the bikes to have. And then uh, eventually uh, I ended up with the uh, Yamaha LC uh, RD250. And, uh, and, and this is the point of time where I was, I was thinking, well, I'm either going to go further in, into biking or basically getting myself into cars. So, unfortunately, when it got to that point, I changed from, from bikes to cars. Uh -huh. But for 25 years, um, I was always into cars, and, and only about five years ago, uh, I found myself taking my CBT uh, here in the UK. The history of my bike riding right now, it comes from this place, uh, P&H yeah. Motorcycles here in Crawley. And uh, I took my 125 uh, CBT and, and I managed to pass that. <laughs> Listen, with all these ridiculously amazing bikes, it must be almost impossible to pick a favourite, but it's the question I've got to ask. It has to be the Desmo Sidici. Oh. <laughs> Probably, in my eyes anyway, one of the greatest bikes ever made. Yeah. Um, and Daddy. one of the best track tools ever, ever had. And, and you've got your full race system on it as well. I put, I put a full race system on it. I mean, if I... Because it didn't sound good enough. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's track ready. I mean, you know, I, I, I might just hand this over to Valentino Rossi. <laughs> just say, do a lap on that, mate. That'd be <laughs> Thank awesome. you. Let me see how he gets on with it, because it's, it, it is truly amazing, this, this machine. And um, I... I'd, I would like to take it on the track for sure. Um, I, I don't think I'm quite ready to take this, this bike on the track at the moment. I mean, you give me any other bike to ride around the track, it's no problem at all. Give me Yamaha R1 or Fireblade or, or give me an Envy Augusta or anything. But yeah. with this one, I think you need a little bit more more guts. And <laughs> oh, I love how passionate you are about bikes. I mean, you, we've, we've talked for hours off camera already about this, and every time you, you know, new stuff's coming out. And, and as you said, you've had an affinity with Ducati. You've, you've been to Bologna as well, haven't you? You've actually seen the factory. Yeah, I, I got asked to go to Bologna and really see the history of Ducati, how they started. And I actually didn't, didn't know that they were actually an electrical company to begin with. Yeah, they, they made electrical components. And, yeah. uh, and this, for me, was amazing to see that, the, the, you know, the history of, 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 of you know, the technology goes, goes back to, you know, I think it's in... The 40s or early 30s. Yeah. I mean, it goes right back. But um, of course, they, they're now more famous for making mo motorcycles and in such a way, and they're always, you know, developing their engines and 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 they've been involved in racing for many many years. And still today, you know, they're, they're still very prolific in, in the race circuit. Um, for me, I, I just love the idea that this is one of the bikes that actually challenges me and on, on my riding and 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 what it gives me. You know, yeah. you know riding the twin twin engine, uh, 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 a V twin engine is unbelievable. Yeah. You know, in the sense of its gearing. And the way how it how it, how it, it pulls in, in low gears and and it just you know it, it, it was this big fight divide between inline fours and between yeah. motors but I, I love them both I, yeah. I, I, I get equally the much pleasure out of each one of them but Ducati it just is, is something that you have to really ride and, and, and ride with conviction <laughs> that, that's, my, that's my experience and, and I found that when I did get more experience in riding that then I, was, I felt really good about Riding on the Ducati and then getting on that and then and then, and then really feeling what the Ducati is all about when it comes to to, to pushing these bikes. Yeah. We did take one over to Ibiza. Well, now this brings <laughs> us on beautifully to the next part, Destination Ibiza. I am so jealous I'm going to come on this year. Uh, we were generally, generally trying to come out and, uh, and film you guys, but tell us a little bit about what this is because this is something you've been doing now for is it the third year. Yeah, this is, this is our third year. Because and... if you didn't know, bike historian here, Carl Cox, also happens to do a bit of DJing in a few <laughs> bars and clubs out there, isn't it? Something like that. <laughs> Yeah, just a couple. I, mean, I, 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 I began on the island now for nearly 25 years now. Every year I've been going, I just love the place. So for me, this is only fitting to, to, to grab, grab one of my bikes and uh, some other like-minded people uh, to take the journey with me over to Ibiza and back. And, and basically, you leave from, from London, um, and then you, you, you go, we ride all the way down to Folkestone, we get, we get the, uh, the train across over to, 
to, to Calais, and then we basically start our, our European journey from there, all the way through to, to, uh, to all the way through France, uh, down to Andorra, and we go through the Pyrenees and everything, and then eventually go through the border of Spain. We find some really good uh, roads uh, going into Ibiza, but halfway down, we, we, we've got a new race track now called Aragon. Yeah, of and, course. And yeah. we have a, the road going to Aragon. It's I've heard you were saying this from the hotel, actually, to the racetrack. It's one of the best roads ever. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I think the first time we did it, I didn't have much sleep. So when, when we went, found ourselves on this road, I was like, at the beginning, I was like, oh, you know, just you know, just get ourselves there. And then I suddenly woke up when I saw the roads going round and down like this, all the way down to the race trail. Like, oh, man. Oh, my God, here we go. So. But and actually, just to kind of go to show how much biking has influenced your life and how much you are into it. I mean, your new album's out now, and it's actually called All Roads Lead to the Dark Tour, isn't it? <laughs> so it's even, you know, it's, it's music imitating art, imitating life, imitating art, imitating bikes. I don't know what's going on there. No, <laughs> me neither, but it really is all about that. You know, yeah. uh, every destination I've ever been to, you know, I've had to take a road to get there, apart from obviously flying to, to the venues, uh, by wherever I end up being. But it's, um, it's, it's, it's been an integral part of my life, uh, riding, and, uh, and it has been from, from when I was at school. Oh. Dude, listen, I mean, it has been amazing having you come in. It's so nice to chat to somebody who genuinely does have, and anyway, anyone can see all the passion <laughs> and zeal you have for your bikes. I mean, thank you, thank you so much. Good luck with the album. Uh, obviously, as I said, all roads lead to the dance floor. Destination on Beatles will be happening next year, which everyone can get involved with. And uh, I, I think we need to go out and ride some Ducatis, mate. Absolutely, I'm ready. Let's go do that now. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> Oh, he's such a nice guy. And you've made a friend for life there, haven't you? You two are like old women nattering away. You should have seen me when he texted me after the interview. I was like, woo, exciting. Um, yes, Carl Cox, what a hero of mine. I grew up, obviously, as a DJ, and he was the first ever DJ to be named number one in the world by Mixed Bag. He was the first DJ to use, like, three decks in the mix. And you couldn't Stalker have imagined... <laughs> yeah, I'm a little bit, I'm not going to lie. You couldn't have imagined him being a nicer guy. And, God, how passionate is he about bikes? I know, and the great thing is he loves Bike Channel, so hopefully we'll get him back on on for another episode which would be cool and maybe he'll invite me to one of his parties and I can have a little bit of a shindig. Enough of the dad dancing for this week I think and that actually brings the show to a close rather nicely. As always you've got any comments, you've got any ideas for things that you want us to check out you can let us know at facebook.com forward slash bike channel or you can follow us on twitter at bike channel and if you want to check out all the interviews, clips, reviews and everything and much more in full just head to bikechannel.com. Anche sto giro è stato divertente. È buona questa Batlax BT-023 Bridge stop. Questa BT-023 dà un piacere sportivo anche per un semplice giro fuori città. Il comfort di guida e il controllo sono sempre al massimo, anche su strade non perfette e soprattutto su bagnato. Con la BT-023 hai stabilità e comfort di guida con tutte le moto, anche quelle di grossa cilindrata. E sulle strade tutte curve ti diverti anche di più, infatti sai cosa c'è? Io vi saluto e torno al test. Ciao!